So thank you for coming here today afternoon and for sharing that very entertaining introduction. <laughs> so I'll speak today on the topic of what is there on this whiteboard. So let us try to discover that. <laughs> let me turn this around. So the topic is yeah. Mm -hmm. It is centering on Krishna, centering our life, centering our spiritual practices and centering ourselves on Krishna. And broadly, I'll take this in four parts. I may not cover all the four parts in detail depending on how the discussion goes. But these four parts are not discrete and they are not exhaustive, but they are indicative that we may start exploring spirituality and start coming toward Krishna from these four broad trajectories. We could say social. Social means we live in a society which is getting increasingly fragmented. So one reason why people often turn towards spirituality is because they want a sense of community. So we want warmer relationships, a sense of belonging. That could be one reason why we come towards spirituality and ultimately towards Krishna. Another could be intellectual, where we have questions about life. What's happening here? Okay. That what is the ultimate purpose of life? Why do we exist? So those questions might be what prompt us to maybe read the Bhagavad Gita, meet some spiritually minded people. And that's what also brings us to Krishna. Mm. Then the third could be psychological. Psychological means that we might have a lot of stress and distress in our lives. And that is one major reason nowadays why people are moving towards spirituality. If you look at the way the churches portrayed God about a hundred years ago and how they portray it now, there's a difference. God was traditionally portrayed as the cosmic supplier. Oh Father, thou art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, give us our daily bread. That is the idea. But now, especially in the Western world, people don't really have much anxiety about their daily bread. <laughs> hmm? So, if God is the supplier of daily bread, God becomes redundant. Mm -hmm. So, God has been, in most, most mainstream churches, rebranded as a cosmic healer, not a cosmic supplier. So, you need healing, you're having stress, you're having emotional wounds. And, oh, you come to God, you'll be healed by that. So our own mental and psychological issues, we may want to deal with them and we may find spirituality a way to deal with it. So many people practice something so that they can feel peaceful, joyful. And then lastly could be cultural. By cultural, I mean that there are some practices that root us in life. It might be we may be brought up in a particular culture where say going to a temple or a church or a mosque or doing some kind of uh, rituals, not using the word rituals in a negative sense. The word ritual has acquired unfortunately negative connotation now. But there might be some practices, certain things which we feel connected with and we do those things. So now any of these can become the impetus for us to come toward Krishna. And all of these are very useful. In the Bhagavad Gita, Krishna says there are four kinds of people who come to him. He says in 7.16 in the Bhagavad Gita, the four kinds of people are those who are distressed, those who are distressed, those who are distressed and those who are distressed. <laughs> so, almost everyone, of course that is not the four categories that Krishna says, he says that Artho Jignasur, Artharthi and Jnani. That those who are distressed is one category. Then those who are inquisitive. Those who are seekers of wealth. And those who are seekers of knowledge. So you could put them in roughly in these four categories. Today major distress is psychological distress. That's a major. There are other distresses are there. But most of the other distresses we feel we can solve by various technological and other means. But this is quite difficult to solve. So that's distressed. Then generally when you talk about people who are inquisitive, 
the most of us are inquisitive more about people so if somebody is inquisitive oh why do you do this why do you chant like this why do you do this practice so you could say that that social inquisitiveness gets us that's one way the other way could be cultural normally when people are in trouble uh, they will they can go to 100 sources if they go to god that's because in the culture that's a practice maybe they saw their parents grandparents friends will go to a temple or a church or something to pray and that's pray and of course there is the gyani the intellectual there's a four ways broadly in which we may start connecting with the spiritual path now the uh, theme which i'm going to speak on is mainly that in each of these areas we can have disturbances earthquakes can occur and say now if we hear that an earthquake has occurred in uh, a new york city okay we'll be disturbed maybe our friends are there our relatives are there but if an earthquake occurs right now over here in princeton that will disturb us much more if an earthquake occurs right under where we are sitting no that would shake us up completely so when the earthquake occurs the the more we are shaken by it indicates that that is where we are sitting that is where we are seated so in our lives when we get disturbed by something if something disturbs us a lot we can understand that why am i getting disturbed by this yes of course the thing is disturbing but this is where my base is so if somebody has come primarily because of questions and they find that oh so many of my questions are answered over here and that's why they keep coming onward but then if they find something which is a make sense to them some questions that are not answered they become very disturbed by it how can there be no question answered no question answered so and other people they will say okay you know why bother there so many questions if one question is asked not answered what is the big deal so so when if this is our base and if this is where it is shaken then we just can't bear it i remember i was primarily attracted through this way so i had when the first time i traveled with a with my spiritual one of my spiritual teachers we were going from pune to mumbai to the five hour four and a half hour journey so i sat next to him in the train and i was telling can i ask some questions he said yeah sure and then i opened up i had like five full scape pages filled with questions <laughs> so he looked at it he said all of these are questions <laughs> he thought a question will 10 15 minutes it would take <laughs> so he is very kind to me yeah, we spent hours and hours discussing but that was what attracted me very much but then over maybe a, after a decade of practice now i found that when i was asking questions there were many people i was myself a teacher for some but i was still a seeker with others and i found i couldn't find very satisfactory answers to those questions in fact i asked one one of my one of the persons who my thought was my guide i asked him that you know i had a series of questions and his answer was that one who has faith for them all questions are answered and you don't have that you have so many questions and answered means that you're lacking in faith oh, when i read that reply i didn't reply but i just felt this is simply intellectual cowardice masquerading as righteousness so i couldn't digest it at that time fact so that was the time when you could say i had my crisis of faith <laughs> but then i met so if this is my basis then i i realized that i have to meet people who are like minded most people are not particularly intellectual yes everybody has an intellectual side to there but that may not be the base so for somebody for whom this was not the base all my questions seem simply like irritating for them why do you have so many questions so but then i met like minded 
spiritual guide or spiritual friend spiritual guides and then i found that they not only had my questions but they had tougher questions than what i also had and they were all trying to navigate their way and find answers that is not necessary that they have to have conclusive answers so then i started thinking okay if you have questions like this which are not yet answered then how are you continuing with your spiritual practices so one of my guides told me that actually on the spiritual path logic should be your minister not your master a minister is one who kings takes advice from and it's important a minister may be wise but logic cannot be your master it's even in day to day life do is everything that we do governed by logic no you know what to speak of our normal relationships if you ask two people form a relationship with each other say so can you give me logical reasons why you are following this relationship you can't isn't it you can't what to speak of even in if in what to speak of normal relationships even if you go in something like science if you go to the fundamental levels in science say if you can look at quantum physics as a quantum physics who said that if you think you have understood quantum physics that means you are not understood it <laughs> it is so complicated no i won't go into the technicalities but you know we consider this to be like a solid object but within quantum physics there is no such thing as solids there is only wave patterns even einstein himself did not like this quantum physics actually he one of his most famous uh, rebuttals to quantum physics not exactly his criticism was he said i would like to believe that even if i am not looking at the moon it continues to exist say what what is that it's obvious isn't it now according to quantum physics the moon is simply a it's it's basically wave forms and those wave forms collapse when there is a conscious observer looking at it and then an object appears to a perception now this is quantum physics is a very complicated subject i don't claim to have understood myself so what i'm giving you is a very bare bones explanation the simple point i'm making is that even in science nobody operates purely on logic so definitely this doesn't mean it's illogical so there are two three things over there there is illogical there is logical and there is translogical translogical is that there is a higher understanding where it is not below logical scrutiny it is above logical scrutiny it makes sense but not in our normal sense of logic so this is basically even einstein said that most of my discoveries uh, are have not been made through my logic it has been through my creativity through my inspiration through my intuition and he said the logical mind is the servant of the intuitive mind so this is not to say that it's illogical but the point is that if our spirituality is based only on this the intellectual then say if i show a quake over here now when the quake happens quake happening now if that is our center we have a choice oh this is shaking and i came here for some stability but this is shaking so what do i do either i can move toward krishna or i can move away from krishna so when something shakes us that indicates that we have not yet come to an unshakable foundation when something shakes us we might be practicing krishna bhakti and ultimately krishna bhakti does give us an unshakable foundation yam labdhva cha param labham manyate na dikam tatah yasmin sthito na dukhena guruna api vicharyate so in the 6th chapter 22nd verse krishna says that when you are situated at that level of consciousness no distress will disturb you he is not saying distress won't be there but distress won't disturb you so if we are being disturbed that means right now we are not yet centered on that unchanging reality on that unshakable reality so if our if we are centered at the intellectual level then when we get unanswered questions then what will happen we will get shaken 
and that time we had to choose so i was fortunate i met like minded uh, spiritual teachers and friends and they helped me move forward so there are many philosophical questions which are i like to call them as intellectual banana peels <laughs> when you step on a banana peel it's fall down so there are some questions if you try to get into them they they just you can't always get logical answers to them that doesn't mean there are no answers but there are answers of a different category logic doesn't have a monopoly on human knowledge so this is one aspect that if we are centered on the intelligence then if we are shaken then if logic is our master we'll be pulled away if logic is our minister okay this doesn't make sense but but my spirituality my devotion my bhakti is more important than logic not that logic is re rejected but logic is transcended and that's how we can come closer to that unshakable center where we can have steadiness where we can have peace where we can have joy so this is one example any comments questions reflections till now yeah so you you mentioned when you were when you found those like minded friends and guys yeah. they didn't it's not i just want to understand um clearly it's not that oh now i found people who have all these answers it's if i'm understanding correctly it's more now i found other people who are also wrestling with the complexity exactly. of the questions yeah. but they're their wrestling with it is not necessarily taking them towards a place of losing faith it's exactly bringing yeah them, but closer to krishna yes it's like the questions don't hold them hostage mm. the questions don't hold their spirituality hostage they're dealing with the questions and they're honestly dealing with questions it's not that oh this is a pat answer to this question no there are questions this, this is the difficult questions how do we answer these and we all try to uh, study analyze read discuss and we try to come to answers that are reasonably satisfactory and maybe in future a more satisfactory answer will be revealed so yes i would say that i have learned to now categorize questions into four broad categories now those questions you just find the right person i'll get the answer say if somebody is if i have some question about the history of bhakti say some something doesn't make sense to me then if i just have find someone who is sufficiently knowledgeable they can answer that question so second is uh, that first uh, second category is where those questions will require me to evolve spiritually mm -hmm. so why is that because things are pursued differently at different times one of the standard examples in the tradition is that say a a, a five or 10 year old girl can't understand what is pregnancy that's it. that doesn't mean she can never understand but she has to grow up so there is a particular time and particular questions will be answered so some questions we need to evolve and that's when we will be able to answer them some questions may require both say consultation and evolution and some questions may never be answered uh, ultimately humility in the intellectual domain means the willingness to acknowledge that i don't know and maybe i can't know so that's how i when i have difficult questions now i try to place them properly and then deal with them appropriately Yes, please. So, uh, in your diagram, is, are you saying that most people, by their tendency, will come to Krishna through one of these four paths, or go away from Krishna by that same path? Yes. See, whatever has brought us, whatever has brought us to Krishna, that remains to some extent our center. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And if that's where we are staying, then if some disturbance comes, then we may not be able to move onward. but if okay this has brought me to krishna but krishna is bigger than this 
you could say each of these is like a frame so if you want to look at the sky we for a small child you raise their hand raise them oh, can you see this tree over there can you see this trunk oh can you see that branch can you see those two branches can you see the moon over there the white object oh can you see this whole sky and, oh yeah the child has no may not have experience of looking up directly so we guide their vision upward so basically like that each of these is a frame by which we can direct our vision toward transcendence but that transcendence transcends all frames so if we are stuck with the frame then we miss the transcendence that's why in the bhakti path it is said that jnana jnana is knowledge intelligence it says jnana can get one on the journey toward krishna but ultimately one has to give up jnana to go toward krishna that doesn't mean we we become ignorant it we recognize the limit of knowledge and we go beyond that Yeah right. Um, where would you place the going towards Krishna just by the fact of awareness, right? There? Because as a kid, okay, and I can put myself in this example, right? As a kid, I think my connection with Krishna was a lot more cultural. My parents took me to the temple every day. Yeah. You know, you have to put your hands together, pray, you have to say a certain verse, mm. and that gets you closer to Krishna, right? But through my life experiences. I have moved away from that to saying um, I have a connection with yeah. this super entity. That's true. But I, like when I see the dialogue, I don't know okay. where I would place myself. I think we, what we will put here with Krishna is experiential. All of us are meant to get some experience of transcendence. So the intellectual is meant to take her toward the experiential. The social is meant. All of these are meant to take us toward the experiential. In the Bhagavad Gita nine chapter second verse, Krishna says that pratyakshavagamam dharmam susukham kartam avyam pratyakshavagamam. That this higher reality can be pursued through experience. So experience means say some of you mentioned that you went to Vrindavan or you came and practiced some yoga and then you wanted to inspire talk about bhakti yoga. So we all get some experience. and that experience is for us uh, the foundation but i'll talk when i talk about psychological i'm going to come to that see our experiences can sometimes be a little deceptive but that's i would say if we just consider our experience to is to be our present moods then we can be deceived by it but all of us have some sublime experiences and those experiences give us a strong conviction and um, there are two stages uh, say that there is shraddha and there is nishtha shraddha is initial faith that maybe something exists out there nishtha is realized or experienced faith and the example given in the tradition is that shraddha is like a ba- banana tree Now, if some elephant or some predator come, they can just shake it. But nishtha is like a banyan tree; nothing can shake it. And it is through experience, through purification, through committed practice, through various of these pathways, we can move from that shraddha to nishtha. So, if we have got nishtha, then that means to a significant extent we are centered on Krishna. Okay. Thank you. Let's say we're stable on one side. It sounds like we should get stable from all these angles, ultimately, right? Uh, should we get stable from all the angles? Not necessarily. I would say, as I said in the beginning, itself, this is not ne- entirely discrete. Hmm. Hmm. Say, for example, uh, if I like that, as a intellectual. Hmm. Maybe intellectual is a different category. We could put a say cultural, social, psychological. You could put the, all of them quite close. Now I go to a temple or a church or a, some holy place. I feel good over there. Now what makes me feel good over there? It could just be the vibes of the place. Hmm? It could be that the people over there are so warm and gentle and cultured. 
So if it's people, then you could put in the social one. If it's just the vibes of the place, then maybe my my own mind is so distressed, and I go there and I feel good. Or I go there and do something. Maybe I sit and meditate. I do some kirtan. I go in front of the image and pray, and, I, and that makes me feel good. So then you could put in culture. So these are not exactly that discreet. The idea is that these are four broad um, patterns of ways. The important thing is we need to be centered on Krishna. So if it's one, it's fine. If it's two, three, that's also fine. The important thing is we center on Krishna. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions, comments? Yeah. yeah I, I really like how, um, at least I'm interpreting it, that, that it is one of those four that can actually drive you away from Krishna, as opposed to if you have that that consciousness. Um, it could be, you know, oh, I, now I don't believe because I heard something else and I've learned more and, I, and, and I'm moving away. Or socially somebody says, you know, that this is not the place for me. I, don't, I, I shouldn't be at this place. I don't like these people. I'm going to go somewhere else. Or even some psychological upheaval will draw you out. It's a, as opposed to sort of just bursting apart for all those reasons. It's, it's pretty, it, looks, it seems to me that it makes sense that it's more discreet to drive you away. From, from that place. Yeah, exactly. So whatever uh, is our current shelter, yeah. it should link us with the supreme shelter. But if the current shelter becomes our substitute for the supreme shelter, yeah. then when that current shelter is challenged, then we may just give it up completely. Mm -hmm. We can go toward the supreme shelter or we can go away from the supreme shelter. So these are not in that sense in any way bad because this is who we are. All of us are social creatures but some of us may be more extrovert than introvert. Some of us really need to be with people constantly or rather we need when, when we have trouble some people deal with trouble by being alone let me think things through. Some people deal with trouble by talking with others. I want someone to unburden my heart. So then depending on who we are one particular approach we will work best for us. Thank you. Yeah. So just to reiterate, if I just want to get the point clear, make sure my understanding is clear. Yeah. If a person is experiencing a weakness or um, a deficit in one of the areas, let's say they're not having a positive experience going to the temple, so their social area is lacking or they don't feel comfortable around a group of people yeah. in the congregation or what it might be. But they're, but they're also weak intellectually. Let's say they're not reading the books or something. Would it be in their best interest to try maybe you know one of the other three approaches to get stronger intellectually or culturally you know, rather than to just lose everything and not even have a grasp on any one of the areas and to risk losing the Krishna consciousness altogether? Could it be that could, mm. uh, could it get that bad that somebody says, "Well, I don't really feel anything in any of these four areas. What should I do? My connection to Krishna is completely leaving me." What would you suggest to someone in that case? Where to find that foothold to grab onto? Yeah, it's a it's a good question. I mean, I'm also uh, developing my thoughts as we are going through this question. So now, since you bring this up, it was as I said, my questions were intellectual. But it was not just the intellectual that solved it, it was also the social. I found a social circle where uh, having doubts was not considered uh, a sign of, was not seen as a deficiency in faith. Mm -hmm. so, and so, in that sense, what helped me to go through was not just the finding intellectual answers, but also social circles. So, I would say that at our level, the operational principle has to be what Rupa Goswami says, Yena kena prakare na mana krishna niveshet. Somehow or the other, fix the mind on Krishna. So we have to find out what connection works for us. And to some extent, the world is a place of illusion. And when the forces of illusion attack us, we can't go with a, with a formula as a plan. I'll do this, 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 this. No. We have to find out what works. 
so we are we can broadly know our strengths and our weaknesses but yes sometimes it might be even if somebody is very intellectual i was talking with uh, one friend who is who's very who's far far more intellectual than me super brain but he told me that when he just uh, gets completely fed up he he says what i do is i go and uh, just uh, sit in front of a tulsi plant and just sing sing songs sing verses sing songs and that calms me down so it's not necessary that it if we are on one we are the solution also has to come to that one we have to find out whatever works for us so in that sense we have to be pragmatic not just stuck to one track but whichever track works and if somebody has come to a place where none nothing seems to be working that all are connect at nothing seems to be connecting us with krishna then then that's the time when we just have to be patient because more often than not that is just a dark phase we are going through so when we go through the dark phase it might be that at that time nothing seems to make sense nothing feels good nothing gives a connection but it's a phase it's a phase and we'll get over so when we are there it can seem like a dungeon but it's not a dungeon it's a tunnel and it's a tunnel and if you keep walking the tunnel will end yeah thank you second part to that question yeah well first a comment uh the comment speaking from personal experience is when i'm in that dark place i try to center on my faith and just know that even if i run away from krishna he runs after me and grabs hold of me and embraces me even if i'm pushing and pushing and pushing and kicking and screaming by now i think in my years of experience in this i know that he's got a hold of me and he's not letting me go and that's my security blanket so that was my comment that's now beautiful. the second part of my question is the solution that you provided is a very good one indeed but how to sort of um delve into that solution and it may require being alone away from people distancing yourself from people how do you do that without creating offense without offending anybody um how do you do that staying humble and without offending your peers your you know members of the community members of the congregation your friends who might think that you know they've done something to hurt you or to offend you okay because yeah it can be so easy to for misunderstandings to occur after all we're all human in the material world and you know feelings are up and things happen and people very easily get offended or misunderstand so how to not only remain centered and take some time out maybe to find what works for us without offending someone else hmm in the two three different things if how do we get that space for ourselves so first is that if there are at least one or two people with whom we can open our heart then they can act as a buffer between us and the rest of the world so it's very difficult for us to explain ourselves to many people mm-hmm. and so if we need space if we have that one person who appreciates our need for space they say you know that okay they need it's some time now they need some time give them some time then if we keep saying it people say oh is something wrong can i help you in fact times people think that a uh, uh, a request for space is a disguised request for help <laughs> now in some cases it can be sometimes it it is it is we have to read people properly sometimes when somebody says leave me alone they actually mean don't leave me alone <laughs> so i had to they had to find out but uh, so if there's somebody who said no they're okay but just need some space so if we if we have that one person also that will help us then the second thing is that if we are a part of a community then uh, within that community also 
there are certain things which are considered important say if you are a member in a good standing yeah then there are certain things you should be doing now we could say that a spiritual community can be completely consuming it can there, there are enough engagements for the rest of our life 24 by 7 that's true but there are certain occasions certain times which are very important so if we are if we just are visible at those times then people don't feel that we are like dropped out of the planet so we may not be as engaged but we are completely disengaged then that raises questions so everybody has their uh, their needs and their priorities so that would be the second thing so that that means sort of become completely invisible and have visibility at least at certain certain things which are considered important and the last thing would be that we have to develop a thick skin that you know people in a sense whatever we do we, there will always be some people who will criticize so spiritual life is you could say it's ultimately about developing a tender heart but intermediately you to cover that tender heart with a thick skin so <laughs> okay thank you yes i, I was also going to say that based on what your, your response was is that all of those paths take discernment you know having to discern you know it's not that i just have to be part of the social group for being part of the social group i have to learn to trust as you say that one or two people that know my heart and um i always think that that if i have a true friend if i say something silly they don't judge me as being silly they say oh she said something silly mm. it's not it's a different level of of friendship and relationships when you say i need my space and say okay no problem you know as opposed to well what can i do to help you you know i told you that <laughs> give me some space <laughs> but so that discernment even in intellectual you know what we read how we choose to who we choose to study with or is even psychological i think a sermon is a very important part of this structure yeah definitely no that's why spirituality cannot be made into a algorithm you cannot have a program put this 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 feed this these parameters this is the result it has to be individualized and that requires discernment thank you so any other comments so let me move on to maybe one more part till how much time do we have and accordingly i can decide how much to take um so it's it's 2:37 right now so maybe we can go till 3 okay fine so i'll try to link these to the social and the psychological part i'll take that one major reason why we connect with spirituality is because we want a sense of community in the past people had joint families whether it was the east or the west now then we had nuclear families mm, now even that nucleus there is a fission and we have electrons and protons <laughs> orbiting around in the concrete jungles <laughs> now we have one clear family one clear unclear unclear, unclear. unclear. okay <laughs> nuclear and unclear okay <laughs> that's good <laughs> unclear family mm. so we all want a sense of connectedness sense of belonging and that is what we do get when we come among spiritual people however even in spiritual circles uh, there are different kinds of people not only different kinds of people the same people also go through different phases in their own lives it said there are two kinds of people some people bring happiness wherever they go and some people bring happiness whenever they go <laughs> so now 
when this happens actually it's and curiously it might be the same person maybe a few years ago when we see them we're so happy and then afterward we see them we feel as if we are walking into a minefield now <laughs> they become tense so people change we change situations change because of that the same social circle which provided us some shelter and strength and support that might seem to take it away mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. or that might itself seem to be the cause of the social disruption the same circle which gave us support mm -hmm. now when this happens at the, at that time we have a choice the choice is that we either see that okay these people are supposed to be spiritual mm -hmm. and they are doing like this they talk like this they behave like this this spiritual stuff doesn't work and we just give it up continuously Com give it up completely and that's an understandable uh, uh, reaction but the problem with that is that we are reducing spirituality to human actions where spirituality is bigger than human actions of course spirituality is manifested through human actions also but the spiritual it transcends all our categories so sometimes we may have some even some spiritual guide some spiritual friends some spiritual mentor and they may inspire us but sometimes it may happen that you know they may let us down or we feel let down even if they have not let us down if these things are if these things can happen when this happens i have to see that my spirituality has to be not reduced to any one thing in this world we may have one path which we follow but even on that one path there can there can be many channels it's the one of the standard examples for spiritual journey or spiritual growth given in the bhakti tradition is of a river moving towards the ocean the ganga for example moving towards the sagar so now when the river is moving towards the ocean at that time the river may have a normal bed and along the bed it's moving it's moving but sometimes that bed may get blocked somebody might come and build a dam over there and when the dam is built over there then the river what cannot move forward any further so when that happens that's when the river what does it do it doesn't just stop it branches out it finds some tributaries it keeps moving on sometimes it might just keep moving over there and may eventually erode the dam also but that may take some time so it branches out and finds a way ahead so many people like you mentioned you know you are you're spiritual but not religious i have a whole talk on this topic but you know what what essentially it is is Uh, this is really when people when most of us say spiritual but not religious the idea is that i don't want any institutionalized religion i don't want dogmas i don't want uh, narrow mindedness i don't want uh, intolerance in the name of religion that's what we are talking about so that's perfectly understandable so how it is that you could say a particular organized path at its essence what it is what is it it is like the bed for the river to move when the water keeps moving continuously along a pa path what does it do it creates a bed for itself and then in the bed it can move forward faster smoother so similarly at its core when we say there is a religious institution what is that it is or i won't go into the terminology of religious and spiritual here whenever at its core what is it a group of people who want to flow toward transcendence they come together and they create the infrastructure they create the resources by which they can practice smoothly so we could say uh, to develop this metaphor further each of us is not a river 
each of us is like a trickle and when many trickles come together then a river is formed and for a trickle to reach from the mountain down to the ocean is quite difficult but there are many small small trickles come together they become river then it can move forward faster so uh, the river bed is like the organization and the river itself is the spirituality so the flow is what is more important but sometimes what happens after uh wherever a bed is created when this water is flowing on its own it may not be that noticeable but when a, there is a big river there's a nice bed through which the water river is going it catches attention and when it catches attention then people who don't want the to go to the ocean they come there and they use that water for their own purposes they start misappropriating it so whenever in a in a group of people who want to pursue something higher than their lives they come together they form some structure and in that structure they try to co- uh, collectively move forward but that structure itself attracts some people who are not interested in spirituality they are interested primarily in the power the prestige the position that is associated with religion and when they come with that purpose they can block the flow i think it was mark twain or was it oscar wilde one of them said that if jesus came back today one thing he would not be is a christian <laughs> now of course any kind of satirical statements like this are very general and this is not to say that there are no genuine christians today but yes it does happen that many people they just get caught in the structures and the purpose may be lost so it has definitely happened and it is it it is not just because of religion it happens in every area of life and if tomorrow uh, we woke up and all of us all that divided us was eliminated all of us tomorrow morning we are born in this same race same color same gender same nationality same religion same philosophy by tomorrow afternoon we would have created differences and started fighting <laughs> so it's just the nature of humanity that we will that inevitably differences will come up and that can lead to fanaticism and the, so the social aspect and the psychological aspect i'm collecting i'm connecting them together right now so the social aspect is where there's a infrastructure people come they want a community but to have the community they create a infrastructure an organization but that attracts power hungry people and then when this power hungry people come up then they just they block the forward movement when that happens some people just get alienated i don't want, i don't want to belong to this community i don't want to have anything to do with this path itself so when this happens the narrow mindedness or fanaticism it is every religious tradition can have some statements which may seem fanatical and I'll, i'll give this as a concluding metaphor and then we can have a few questions if you want so basically to change the metaphor from the flow of the river we could take climbing up a mountain so the bottom of the mountain is material consciousness the top of the mountain is spiritual consciousness and there can be different paths up the top up to the from the bottom to the top so these different paths are like the different spiritual traditions which are meant to help us move up now in every tradition there are some statements which are exclusivist this is the only way and those statements have to be seen in context it's like a say a patient has come to a doctor and the doctor starts prescribing something diagnosing something and prescribing something and the patient starts saying that 
oh but doctor i went to this doctor and the doctor said that and i read this book and that that book says this and i googled and i found this <laughs> and the doc <laughs> the doctor will say just forget everything take what i am telling you do what i am telling you you will get cured now when the doctor says forget everything that you are read forget everything else that is not a absolute rejection of all other knowledge it is a contextual emphasis to follow what is being told so every tradition has statements like this just forget everything else i follow this now if these are made into absolute truths then that becomes fanatical so if somebody just going round and round at the bottom of the mountain hey this path this path this path just forget it climb up now <laughs> that doesn't mean <laughs> that all the other paths are are false it is that you have to commit to one path to climb up so forget everything so exclusive statements are to be taken in that sense they are meant to create focus they are not meant as a rejection of everything else but some people they take it as a rejection of everything else they say if you are not following my path you are going to go to hell <laughs> not only are you going to go to hell i'll help you get there faster <laughs> <laughs> so it's like instead of climbing up the mountain instead of climbing up the mountain they keep going round and round pulling others down from the mountain <laughs> don't climb up don't climb up there that's wrong that's wrong <laughs> so this kind of narrow mindedness can alienate a lot of people and when we encounter a block like this that say we came for a community but then we find find people who are who are maybe very selfish very insensitive very judgmental very um, not the kind of people we would like to be with at that time what do we do we understand that it's like that the river not everybody who's at the river is there to go to the ocean there might be some who might be there for some other purpose entirely now we can't look into anybody's heart so we don't necessarily we may say that they are judgmental we don't have to become judgmental about them so we don't know but this is not what gels with me so we keep a distance and we find a way forward we find a way forward so we again look for like minded people if it's not in immediately that community we look for some other community we look for even one person like minded and is the one trickle also can start moving that trickle will grow so the important thing is that we move for we stay fixed in our purpose so sometimes the social group which helped us grow may eventually stop our growth that's not necessarily a problem with their social group it could be it could be just we incompatibility the way they think way we think is not the same then we find out a social group where we can move on so if we understand that okay these people are supposed to be spiritual why are they behaving like this then rather than asking that question you can say okay we could change the question and ask that i am spiritual do i always behave like a spiritual person everybody goes through phases in their life and rather than reducing spirituality to the behavior of certain people we look are there some people even now on the spiritual path who i am attracted to who i feel inspired by let me take them as my example and let me move on if we do that we will always find some inspiration some guidance some path ahead and eventually we will come to these two aspects in our spiritual life there is transcending the world and there is transforming the world so that means now in each of these when we see something wrong say sometimes we find that even those who are spiritual people they are very insensitive then psychologically people don't care for each other's emotions just become a little judgmental so now to some extent we transcend it this is how it is but my focus is on moving toward krishna but it's not just transcending the one part of it is transcending the other part of it is transforming that means can i become an agent of change 
okay if people are insensitive if people are judgmental if people are completely non intellectual people give pat answers to questions then can i can i find deeper answers can i give those deeper answers so we if there is a there is a earthquake over here then we treat as much as we can we try to provide relief for ourselves for others but along with that so that is transcending over transforming over here but we also move forward that is transcending so sometimes there is very little in our control and we just have to transcend the situation this i can do nothing about it let me just move ahead from this but sometimes when the situation is disturbing we can transform it if we have the initiative if we have the we have the position if we have the stature if we have the zeal then we can transform also and then if we are if we can take the take the responsibility to transform then we can become uh, become aids for others through navigate to navigate through that path so the challenges which we faced when others face it let them go through it so the same let's say i'll conclude this the same devotee who same spiritual guide of mine who said that uh, you know you have doubt, uh, you know because you have doubts so you have so many questions now he's also quite a prominent spiritual teacher now he whenever people ask him difficult questions he sends them to me <laughs> this you answer their questions uh, so the, so he is also so it was not that he had any problem with me it is not that he had a problem with those questions also he just felt that why are you burdening me with this so he understand that the people may have questions and somebody needs to be uh, there as a resource to answer those questions so that's how we can in our small way create a way for people to navigate the pitfalls that we have faced in our spiritual journey so i'll summarize quickly what i spoke so i spoke on this topic of centering on krishna in our spiritual life in our life at large uh, i started by talking about we all come to krishna because of various reasons it might be social intellectual psychological or cultural it might come for a sense of belonging answers to questions or because we are having a lot of mental issues or because we want some cultural connects so now each of these is very valuable but each of these can become our center and if you are centered over there when a quake occurs either that quake will throw us away from krishna or it pushes us toward krishna if we have equated spirituality with these things only if you have reduced krishna to okay answers to all questions if you have reduced krishna to very sweet loving dealings among people then if we have reduced krishna to a peaceful atmosphere <laughs> then <laughs> when that is not there we will think what is this where is krishna so that is an opportunity for us to move more toward the essence of krishna so i talked about my faith crisis when i had question it was the answers to question that brought me toward krishna but after some time the kind of questions that i had my spiritual guys didn't have the answers so at that time fortunately i got like minded people who honestly were wrestling with the question which i was having and that gave me breathing space to keep moving on so logic is meant to be a minister not our master there is illogical there is logical and there is trans logical so the infinite the transcendence cannot be reduced simply to logic i talk in relationships also everything is not logical even in science everything is not logical the intuitive mind plays as much role as a or if not more than logical mind so same way with respect to other aspects of our life we talked about the social aspect that we come to spirituality because we get warmth and connectedness in a community but then sometimes everybody there may not be like that so give the example of the community coming together and forming an organization that's like a trickle moving continuously and forming a river bed but that river bed may attract others who just want the water for themselves and not to go toward the ocean so like there are some people with vested interests may come up and then the organization may become an obstacle instead of a path towards the ocean then we have to find our way and keep moving on and let's give the example of a mountain climbing up 
So narrow-mindedness, when we say that we want to be spiritual but not religious, the idea is that we don't want to be narrow-minded, intolerant. So there can be different paths up the mountain, but at the same time, we have to commit to one path and not pull others down from their path. So statements of exclusive import, which are there in certain traditions, they are meant to create focus, not declare rejection of or condemnation of all other paths, like a doctor telling a patient, just forget everything else, take this medicine. So when we have this context, then even if we find ourselves blocked at a particular point, we'll find a path and move on. And for us, when we have some quake happening where our shelter is, and we feel disturbed by that, we have two components, transcending and transforming. So we just move beyond it, connect with Krishna by our experience of Krishna. I talked about this experiential faith is like a banyan tree. The preliminary faith is more like a banana tree. So through all of these, we are meant to move forward, get experience. So we transcend by our experience of Krishna. And then we transform so that we can help others navigate the quakes when they come in their life. And thus, smoothen their journey for them. Thank you very much. Hare Krishna. very refreshing talk. Um, I appreciated quite a few points. One point that struck me when you talked about, uh, you know, the little girl may not understand what pregnancy means, but it doesn't mean eventually she won't understand. And so sometimes I feel um, that there might be a point in bhakti that I'm not understanding, but, you know, finding the patience to like either ask my spiritual teachers and guides or read Srimad Bhagavatam, Bhagavad Gita regularly, to try and find the answers means that eventually I'll come to that. Mm. And I wonder if you can maybe speak about, you know, it's great to have a bunch of questions, but sometimes we can, you know, at work, especially I work in corporate life. So, you know, we have this phrase like analysis, uh, paralysis by analysis, analysis, yeah. right? You don't want to do that, right? You don't want to tangle yourself up so badly because you're constantly questioning yourself and going around in circles uh, so that you actually miss the goal of moving towards mm. Krishna. Can you speak about that, please? Yeah, it's you know, tying ourselves up in questions, a paralysis by analysis, how do we avoid that? It depends on individual to individual. You know, for some people, they may have paralysis because they are not able to do analysis also. <laughs> you know, I want to analyze, I want to understand. If this doesn't make sense, I can't move forward. But for some people, it could be the opposite. So everyone has their particular need. So for some people you say, don't think so much. But you know, it's not that I'm choosing to think, my thoughts are just going over there in that direction. And so I was in DC last week, so one person asked a question after that program. It is a quite, a, you could say, volatile question. This, this, this gentleman is asking, is it that women have a very long memory? He says, <laughs> he said that I did something in 77 and my wife still remembers that. <laughs> I did not do something and she still remembers and complains about that. I told her, forget it. <laughs> so then I, exp I told her that I don't remember the answer to this question. <laughs> but basically, the point I made over there is that all of us, you say in our relationships, we almost, you can say, we deal in different currencies. So if you give me some valuable product, and I give you an INR, Indian rupees, and you have no idea what INR is. He would say, you're not giving me anything. And I say, I've given you so much, why are you not appreciating? <laughs> so what happens in different relationships, different people consider different things important. So for some people, just quality time is important. You just sit and talk and discuss things. For some people, it might be you keep your word. You say, you do this, you'll do it. You don't do it, they feel very disturbed by it. For some people, it might be that uh, give gifts on special occasions, whatever it is. So, you know, generally, people trade in different currencies. So, now, if we want to understand which currency who is trading in, uh, one simple way is 
to understand what they appreciate the most if we do it and what they complain the most about if we don't do it hmm. so now we may do a hundred like a child a father may work very hard and get the most expensive cricket bat and cricket ball and uh, for the kid to play in. but the child may not want the expensive bat the child may just want dad you play with me dad says i am tired i don't have time then the child will feel completely unloved and the father may say i have been doing so much for you how can you feel unloved <laughs> so they're trading in different currencies so i would say the same principle applies with with this also that for some people analysis is the currency they trade in and if you tell them don't analyze yeah. then it's like what do you mean you are making me poverty stricken you're leaving me with nothing so we can't really say that don't analyze but what we could say is that even people who are analytical they start understanding when their analysis is taking them forward and when it is not taking them forward so <clears throat> if the analysis is not taking them forward then it's best not to say that i will not analyze uh, but to suspend it for some time because the brain is also like a machine say if we have been working on a computer for a long time the computer heats up it needs to be shut down for some time then it can start working better so you could say that just continuously thinking about it may not help so instead of saying don't analyze this anymore maybe just decide to have some quality time for analysis hmm? instead of constantly thinking about it and letting it worry weigh you down just decide that okay this is an important question maybe once a day once a week sit down for some time and see if you are getting some fresh insights or whatever thoughts you come put them together and see how things are moving forward so rather than uh, rather than stopping analysis we could we could say we could uh, uh, give a quota for analysis you have to do this but do it during this time and then that way uh, there can be more productive because just overthinking it's like say if we consider a problem versus time you know if we don't think about the problem at all we will be impulsive so when we think about a problem we say the the clarity starts in <coughs> increasing okay what should i do should i do this do this and the more we think about it the clarity increases but that's only up to a particular point after that that graph becomes solid it just becomes flat and after that it starts going down the more we think about it the more we become confused some people say i was confused earlier now i'm not so sure <laughs> so i am confused whether i am confused <laughs> it can become like that so basically if we ourselves can see that thinking it is taking giving us some clarity but after that it's not giving clarity then then regulate it i mean have some time for doing it but don't let it constantly burden the mind and then it's best to try to have uh to connect with somebody who is analytical then what happens even if see for some people it is it is analysis that stimulates them even if they don't get the answer by the analysis for some people analysis is the tool to a solution but for some people just they love to think and you tell them stop thinking it just becomes becomes too much for them so then if they have two analytical people the two of them can keep analyzing stimulating each other even if they don't get an answer at least they get some stimulation so that can also work it like in a negative sense what happens if there are i used to wonder if there are there's a judgmental person they they just it's very difficult for them to become friends with anyone else because they keep judging everyone else but what happens if two judgmental people come together isn't it actually they become very good friends <laughs> because they don't judge each other they judge the world together <laughs> <laughs> so that is unhealthy but the point is that that it's a uh, analysis also works like that 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 yeah analysis two analytical people even if they don't come to a solution just if they get different friends of analysis that itself gives them some stimulation that i'm doing something and then they can move on but we have to ask and see whether it's become unproductive or counterproductive then check it 
So, thank you very much. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. So, um,